Hello, this is the second of a series of talks I'm doing criticising the Austrian school in economics. The Austrian school are significant because they provide a key part of the libertarian free market argument against socialism. And in the last talk I dealt with Mises who was the first of the Austrian economists to get involved with this. Then later on in the 1930s and going on Hayek was involved in this and he was probably more influential in actually shifting economic policy. He was the great guru of Margaret Thatcher. Now because it's a big topic I'm going to spread the critique of Hayek over two videos. So this is video one of that series. I'm starting off with an introduction and I'll look at Hayek's argument. I'll then look at the response that Alan and I developed to this in the 1990s and then I'll give a brief look towards what I'm going to present in the second video. My objective is to refute the objections to socialist planning put forward by Hayek in his classic article The Use of Knowledge in Society. Hayek is important because even those who balk at his extreme enthusiasm for the unfettered market are often quite ready to see his arguments used to bury any kind of effective thoroughgoing socialism. So you end up with people who claim to be socialists actually reproducing arguments that Hayek produced as arguments against socialism. To be fair to Hayek, I'm going to present his arguments first. Look at the philosophical background, how he defines the basic problem of economics, the emphasis that he and the Austrians put on change and then what he says about prices and information and it's his emphasis on price and information that distinguishes him from Mises and you get Austrian economists saying oh Cockshot and Cottrell have, may have critiqued Mises on the feasibility of economic calculation but they haven't responded to Hayek on information. Well, we did respond to Hayek on information in the 1990s, and I'm reproducing these arguments here. Okay, first point is that Hayek is a resolute opponent of the applying the scientific method to society. He says that the facts studied by social science differ from the facts of physical science in being beliefs and opinions held by particular people. Beliefs which as such are, are our data, irrespective of whether they're true or false, which moreover we cannot merely observe in the minds of people, but we can recognise from what they do or say, merely because they have a mind similar to ours. Now that is a, a an initially plausible thing and will appeal to many young students I would say. But there's an irreducible subjective element to it. He says most of the objects of social or human actions are not objective facts in the special narrow sense in which the term is used in the sciences and contrasted to opinions. They cannot at all be defined in physical terms. So far as human actions are concerned things are what acting people think they are. Well, that is a terrible level of subjectivism. It, the misperception of reality, taking your beliefs for reality, leads to all sorts of disasters. You only need to think of the beliefs that the British imperialists had in 1940 
that the Japanese were small backward people were incapable of inventing any modern technology and contrast that with the reality they came to face with when war broke out in 1941. Beliefs are not the things are not what people think they are and because they're not what people think they are people get nasty surprises. He, th he thought that this difference between the subjective nature of society and objective facts introduced a fundamental dichotomy between the study of nature and the study of society. Since in dealing with natural phenomena it may be reasonable to suppose that the individual scientist can know all the relevant information while in the social context that condition cannot possibly be met. And again this subjectivist approach gets repeated by lots of people who have had an education say in the bourgeois social sciences or not the social sciences but maybe in, in so social studies and in uh, the liberal arts. The, these themes in Hayek get repeated widely. Now what is the problem of an economy? He says the peculiar character of the problem of a rational economic order is determined precisely by the fact that the knowledge of the circumstances of which we were to make use never exists in a concentrated or integrated form but solely as dispersed, dispersed bits of information frequently contradictory knowledge which separate individuals possess. So the subjective this standpoint continues the economic problem is basically a problem about bringing coherence to the different subjective views that exist in society. So starts off with the subject, subjective views that people have in society and that is the economic problem, to bring these subjective views into um, some coherent form. The true problem therefore of how to secure the best resources known of, to, to any members of society for the ends whose relative importance only these individuals know. That it is not generally understood, Hayek claims, is an effect of naturalism or scientism. That, that is to say, the erroneous transfer to social phenomena of the habits of thought we have developed in dealing with the phenomena of nature. So this term scientism is a rebuke that Hayek was using and you again get some people on the left will actually continue to use that term perhaps not realizing its reactionary origins. The point at issue between Hayek and the proponents of socialist planning is not whether planning is done or not, it's whether planning is done centrally by one authority for the whole economic system or is to be divided among many many individuals. The latter case, he says, is nothing other than market competition, which means decentralised planning by many separate persons. And again, this Hayekian standpoint recurs in the things that many anarchists on the left say. The next step in Hayek's argument involves distinguishing two kinds of knowledge. Scientific knowledge, that is to say what he calls knowledge of general laws, versus unorganised knowledge, or knowledges of particular circumstances and place. The former, he says, is subject to centralization, but the latter is a different matter. Well. he lived before Google. Change is another important point. Hayek ascribes to his opponents the idea that economically relevant change is something that occurs at discrete intervals or a fairly long time scale and that between such changes the management of the productive system is more or less a mechanical task. Well, that is not exactly a realistic description 
of what Soviet planning was doing. You've never seen such a rapid period of change as that brought out by Soviet planning. If anything, the idea that change is rare and not a, a, an important issue is most prevalent in the socialist advocates of cooperatives or market socialist system since none of them have a coherent account to how to deal with radical structural change of the sort that early Soviet industrialization involved or the sort that we're going to need to deal with environmental um, planning. Now against this he cites for example the problem of keeping costs from rising in a competitive industry which requires considerable day-to-day -day managerial energy and he emphasizes the fact the same technical facilities may be operated at different cost levels by different managements. Effective economical management requires new dispositions made every day in the light of changing circumstances not known the day before. Well part of that is just due to the chaotic character of the market. So the chaotic character of the market is brought in to justify the chaotic character of the market. But when it comes to different facilities may be operated at widely different cost levels, well that's the same point Kantorovich was making some years before Hayek wrote. And Kantorovich came up with an effective means by which socialist planners can calculate what the most effective in the most cost-efficient way of using machinery and equipment is. Prices and information. This is a, a, a central theme of his that the market acts as a telecommunication system. Assume that somewhere in the world a new opportunity for the use of some raw material, for example tin has arisen, or that one of the sources of supply of tin has been eliminated. It doesn't matter for our purposes, and it's very significant that it doesn't matter which of these two causes made tin scarce. All that the users of tin need to know is that some of the tin they used to consume is now more profitably employed elsewhere, and that in consequence they must economise on tin. There is no need for them, the great majority of them, even to know where the more urgent need has arisen, or in favour of what other uses they ought to husband the supply. The significant thing about the price system is the economy of knowledge which it operates. And I will come back to this in more detail when I look at Hayek's arguments from the standpoint of modern information theory. He also admits that the adjustments produced by the price system are not perfect in the sense of general equilibrium theory, but he still claims they are a marvel of economic coordination. The problem is that he, if he's got no standard to say how good are they, are they, do they give the right answers, what is his claim for it to being a marvel other than that he likes it? We know that he's writing, he came to prominence during the 1930s at a time of massive recession with tens of millions of unemployed across the capitalist world. Was this a marvel of economic coordination? Clearly not. But he still is willing to claim that the market is a marvel of economic coordination. Now what response did we make? Um, because of the length of the topic, I'm only going to cover it some, some of it now. The outline of Hayek's argument is, is pretty clear. and I'm going to criticise it on two grounds. In this video, I'm challenging the subjective philosophy which underpins Hayek's conception of information. In a subsequent one, I'm going to critique the idea of the, mar the, the idea that the market constitutes an effective communication system and use Shannon's information theory and algorithmic information theory to mathematically go into what communication takes place in the market, what communication takes place in a central planning system and show that the central planning system is more economical in communication than the market. For a background to the points I'm going to make here, 
I suggest you have a look at my video Commodity Production and the Subject, which argues that the notion of the subject is something that was constructed by bourgeois legal ideology and later by bourgeois philosophy at a specific point in time around the time of the French Revolution and that it's then become accepted as common sense in bourgeois society. But it's a historically contingent idea. It's an idea generated by capitalist relations of production. Hayek's subjective this view is open to the objection that its central category, the rational subject, is now known to be dubious on psychological grounds. There's a lot of psychological and sociological research that shows that human behaviour is highly routinized, and most of it is coordinated by unconscious brain functions, reflex activities. In fact, if you read Dennett, the materialist philosopher, in his book Consciousness Explained, he relates many experiments in neurophysiology that indicate that people act first and then only later become conscious of the intention to act. That the intention to act is an illusion. Our reflexes make us act and we then construct a story that we intended to do it. The problem with this whole subjectivist approach is it's, is it's based on reification. Economic subjects are legal abstractions, they're not people. The main actors aren't people in an economy. The main act, economic actors are big firms not human individuals. And the actions of a big firm can't be reduced to the inner subjective life of its managing director. Big firms have actions which result from procedures, reviews, etc. involving many people. And the procedures and the structure are more important than the people. The procedures, the structure and the imperative created by capitalism to maximise profit are more important than the people. And the subject which Hayek uses to justify his whole argument is in fact itself a reification of economic theory. It's a projection onto psychology of the behaviour of the firm or the actions of the firm. As a philosophical category it's a projection of bourgeois property relations. And to have recourse to it when justifying bourgeois property relations is a circular argument. Because the concept of the subject doesn't arise until you have bourgeois property relations. I, uh, I go into this in commodity production and the subject. In the early stages of capitalism, the distinction between legal personalities and people was ill-defined. A lot of businesses were owned by one person and therefore the capitalist appeared to be the man rather than the firm. But even in the early stages of capitalism in the 18th century you had the Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company. Vast organisations, so vast that they came to rule over subcontinents. These were the subjects, the legal personalities, which dominated the world. Dominated the world and actually subjected the Indians, turned the Indians into the subjects of, the, of Britain. And the rational calculating subject in economics is actually the profit maximizing firm. It's what Marx calls an individual capital. And bourgeois thought projects the properties of individual capitals onto the individual. The utilitarian, 
they talk the bourgeois economics talk about the individual being utility maximizing that is just a projection onto psychology of the practice of a firm of maximizing profit it's not based on actual experimental psychology it's adopted in the 1870s by Jeevans as a, an axiom so the claimed existence of subjects is actually a matter of religious belief it is a religious belief of the bourgeoisie and by starting with this act of faith Hayek is making his economics essentially a religious ideology there's a lot of controversy over to what extent was Hayek a Catholic he was brought up a Catholic but had he did he react against it we well, may have reacted against it in part but he thoroughly adopted the idealist and subjectivist viewpoint of, of um, Catholic uh, theology the subject is not an empirically existing property of people it's something ascribed to them by bourgeois right by bourgeois law so the exclusion of science from the study of society is untenable because science has to explain the laws of motion of society it has to explain the ideological forms which the historical development of society takes you cannot just take the one of those ideological forms the abstract legal personality something produced by bourgeois law and use that as a reason why you can't scientifically study the evolution of human societies through history the evolution of modes of production and the laws of motion of modes of production what he's doing is just one more special plea by conservative morality against science something which Catholic morality has been doing for a long time and his argument against socialist planning is heavily reliant on this subjectivism it hinges on the notion of subjective information his book the counter-revolution in science was actually published shortly after the establishment of an objective scientific information theory by Shannon but his notion of information that he uses in the book remains resolutely pre-scientific for him information is something subjective something in people's minds and thus the problem that the economy faces of was is how dispersed information in the minds of many can be combined to the common good and because it's irreducibly subjective he argues against any kind of planning between when Shannon wrote and the discovery of the genetic code in 1961 the scientific information of scientific understanding of information was completely revolutionized it had a huge conceptual change we live in the world which information technology and information theory is a fundamental foundation of the mode of production what modern science has shown is that there's a deep connection between information and physics maybe I'll talk about that in other videos that quantum mechanics for example operates in such a way as to conserve information and most importantly that information is something objective not subjective this kind of subjectivism of Hayek is commonplace people often say that without human subjects creating it there's no information that information is something irreducibly related to one human being communicating with another lots of people who don't think they're Hayekians will parrot this kind of nonsense on the contrary what modern science shows is that there are no humans no human beings at all far less capitalist subjects without the objectively information 
objectively existing information in the genetic code. Information exists objectively. And without the information in the genetic code, you wouldn't exist. It's objective information, information independent of the bourgeois subject that allows life and allows evolution. And if you don't believe it, walk into Chernobyl and the genetic, your genetic code will be randomised by gamma rays and you won't survive long. Now, we now have objective measures by which we can study communication. Information is objectively measurable. The whole of the internet, the whole of information technology is based on that fact. It, it can also be processed mechanically and stored. This wasn't really true at the time when he was first writing. And we have exact metrics for communication. Looking forward to my next video, I'm going to introduce information metrics and I'll apply them to prove that market competition is less efficient than socialist planning. In the next two slides I'm going to show you the references that were used for the original article on which this is based, which you can look at if you're interested in background information.